Hey guys, uh, welcome back. I'm Ted, your host, and today's lecture topic is going to be Hannibal Barca, uh, the famous Hannibal from history, the one who crossed the, ele uh, the, the Alps with elephants. He's regarded as uh, Rome's single greatest enemy that they ever faced, uh, and also one of history's greatest military commanders. Uh, it's often said that he knew how to attain victory, but not how to use it. And before we really get into the story of Hannibal Barca or his career, we first have to do a little bit of recapping and go over the uh, Punic Wars. Uh, and I already uh, discussed the origin of the Punic Wars with the Mamertimers, uh, the Mamertines and their adventures in Sicily. But we're not going to discuss that, we're just going to do a, a brief skimming over uh, what actually transpired between the Romans and the Carthaginians. And the Punic Wars were fought about 50 years before Hannibal's uh, career. And close to 400,000 people died in that war. And it's it, was, uh, it comes down to us, it's regarded as being very vicious, even by ancient standards. There was certainly no love lost between the Carthaginians on one hand and the Romans on the other hand. And the war pretty much ended in a stalemate. There was no clear-cut winner in the war. Uh, most people think that the Romans pretty much uh, marched over the Carthaginians and that they just ground them into dust and that wasn't the case. Uh, Carthage was run like a business. The Carthaginians, uh, they decided that the war had just been disastrous for their commercial uh, interest and they just decided to end it quickly. And and the, uh, the peace, because they decided to end it uh, quickly, the peace was sort of disastrous. For the Carthaginians, their naval, their, their navy was limited to only 100 ships, which it, which is uh, just debilitating for a seaborne commercial power. But to rebound from the uh, the war, the one the war indemnity, but then also the loss of uh, their commercial aspects and territorial um, positions uh, possessions in Sicily, they uh, they moved to Spain. They decided to rebuild their commercial uh, um, their commercial empire, their commercial. Uh, interest in Spain. So they uh, moved to Spain. Uh, they sent over uh, they sent over state personnel and military forces uh, and also merchants to Spain and they began to exploit the mineral wealth of Spain. And they amassed a fortune rather quickly. Uh, they built up a huge land force in lieu of naval strength and this is where Hamilcar Barca, the, fa the father of Hannibal, really comes onto the scene. He was a distinguished uh, Carthaginian commander in his own right. He had fought um, for the Carthage. He had fought for Carthage in Spain, and he was also a uh, veteran of the First Punic War. And he was really disgruntled. Um, he was a, he sort of uh, fit the uh, the stereotype of the disgruntled veteran uh, coming home after war, and you know just being upset with the way that the government and the politicians handled everything. He uh, he instructed his son in the art of war. Uh, he died in around 228 BCE. Uh, and he was instrumental in uh, establishing Carthage had the power uh, in Spain. And now the build-up to the to the uh, Hannibalic or Second Punic War. Uh, when Hamilcar died, he was not directly succeeded by any of his sons. Instead, he was uh, succeeded by Hasdrubal the Splendid, his son-in-law. And the nickname the Splendid sort of gives a little insight into uh, what he was like as a man and how his contemporaries remembered him. Now, it, and, uh, and Hasdrubal is uh, his um, his time as uh, the overall commander of the Carthaginians in Spain is eventful because sometime in the 220s BCE, he came to an arrangement into uh, an agreement with the Romans regarding their spirits of influence in Spain. And the Ebro River uh, was chosen as the line for uh, demarcation to uh, to uh, differentiate where the Romans and where the Carthaginians uh, would hold sway. And the treaty, or at least the Roman copy of the treaty, because we do not have the Carthaginian copy, uh, the, Ro uh, the, co the Roman copy said that the Carthaginians would not go north of the river but it does not say that the Carthaginians will not move south of the river, which uh, is sort of suspect. You know, most people would uh, logically draw the conclusion that if you're dividing Spain, you're going to say that I won't go north and you won't go south. But the Roman copy does not uh, contain anything. Uh, does not contain anything uh, diff uh, stating that the Romans won't move south. Just that the Carthaginians won't move north. 
and now and that's uh that's really uh a point of interest because sometime later the romans actually uh took the town of saguntum which is south uh, of the Ebro River under its protection. And Hannibal, by this time, Hannibal was the overall commander of uh, Carthaginian forces in Spain. And he took extreme exception to the Romans simply, you know, moving south of the river like that. So he decided to besiege the town. And after he began, uh, after he began his uh, besiegement, the Romans sent notice to the Carthaginians demanding that Hannibal be turned over to them for trial. Carthage refused and war was declared. This was, uh, and it, all of this happened in 219 BCE. So now we move on to uh, the meat and potatoes of Hannibal's career, the Second Punic War or the Second Hannibalic War. Uh, and uh, and at the very beginning, Hannibal he set out with an army of 50,000 men, um, but not just uh, fighting troops. He also set up with uh, elephants. He was bringing war elephants. Uh, and this is really the first time that, um, that you see war elephants moving through southern France and making their way into uh, North Italy. Uh, Hannibal, he, uh, he marches through, he marches from modern day Catalonia in uh, Spain through southern France to the western edges of Italy. Now, he doesn't invade Italy, uh, he doesn't go take the, uh, the typical, uh, you know, route from, uh, let's say, Nice to uh to piedmont he doesn't go he doesn't go that way uh because the romans have uh the romans you know everyone is uh tracking that he's moving his army uh through southern france he's leaving, everyone is tracking this everyone is following this so the romans they station armies uh at strategic river crossings hoping to you know just catch him at the border uh so hannibal anticipating this decides to go on the very audacious uh Route. Uh, he decided to take this very audacious route and move through the Alps, um, which itself, you know, even now moving an army across the Alps would be an incredible feat. Uh, think about doing this, you know, before. Uh, think about doing this with pack animals and war elephants of all things. Uh, so he's moving his army, fifty thousand strong, uh, with elephants through the Alps, and it's not a peaceful sojourn. It's not a, a very easy journey. It's not. It's not very easy going at all. He loses about one third of his army uh, because he had to battle through uh, through these Al he had to battle all the uh, Alpine natives, these Gallic people, these very bellicose people living in uh, what is now you know I guess Switzerland and North Italy. He had to battle them. Has his army moves past, uh, and everyone wanted a piece of him. You know, everybody they didn't like the Romans, but they didn't like uh, foreigners either. So everyone is battling him as he's moving through, and he emerges, you know, with his army more or less intact and. The moment he reaches northern Italy, uh, the local peoples, they just flock to his banners. Um, the Romans had recently incorporated north Italy into, uh, into uh, their confederation. They recently brought those people under their control. And they were sort of, you know, not really full-fledged members of the Roman alliance system in Italy. So they rather easily, rather uh, with little provocation, simply uh, ditched, the Roman, um, ditched the Romans and joined the Carthaginians and his army replenished by those North it Italian Gallic tribesmen. Now we move to uh, the Battle of the Taconis River, which was really the first of three big battles that Hannibal fought to really establish his legend among the Romans and future generations. Okay, so Hannibal moving his uh, now replenished army uh, through Italy is uh marching is uh you know really just uh leaving north italy and marching into uh central italy and the romans they decide to oppose him they uh they they can't really they they've been outsmarted with him going uh with him um with him just uh moving away from there uh the forces they sent to confront him at the um at the uh, borders of western italy They've been outsmarted, and they uh, had to redeploy their forces to stop him from causing any serious damage. And before we, let me just retrack uh, before we get to the actually, um, before we actually get to the, to the mechanisms of the battle. Um, let me just uh, do a, a brief recap to uh, state exactly how the Romans and Carthaginians went about battle and how their armies were comprised. Now the the Carthaginians, in lieu of a professional army of uh, citizen soldiers. They simply went out and hired mercenaries. Uh, they, the uh, it was very interesting. Uh, as far as uh, rowing in their fleets, 
they had a lot of citizens who simply rode in the fleets but not a lot of citizens who actually served in the army uh you had some people who uh and whenever you did find Carthaginians serving in the army it was only has like a military commander it never had like uh an actual fighting man fighting soldier only has uh officers and commanders whereas you will find the average Carthaginian athlete rowing in the Carthaginian navy and this is in a stark contrast with the Romans who of course were using citizen levies the Romans didn't have a permanent professional standing army at the time they were all part-time soldiers these were all citizen soldiers citizen levies and the Romans they went about battle in a certain way it had to be orderly it had to be neat there was a series of progressions to battle and the Carthaginians and their mercenaries they made war chaotic it was a uh, Battles, uh, you know, body part flying everywhere, swords going everywhere, spear going everywhere. Just make it a mess. Make it a mess. That was, uh, that was the Carthaginian and their um, mercenary, and their mercenary troop. That was their approach to to warfare. Okay, uh, and now for the battle, uh, and and Hannibal knew this. He knew that if he had, that if he rattled the Roman, that if he uh, caused the line to break, if if he prevented battle from being progressed in a certain way that he would attain victory, that he would rather quickly destroy the Roman army or defeat the Roman armies, and that's what happened. Uh, from the very beginning, the Carthaginians just made the battle chaotic, and the Romans, they were not prepared to handle this, and they were routed. They suffered about 2,000, they uh, suffered a loss, and they lost about 2,000 men in the actual fighting. And now to follow up of uh, this battle, Hannibal then engaged the Romans at uh, the battle, um, known as the Battle of the Trebia, Trebia River and he goaded the Roman commander a man named Sempronius into an ill-advised winter uh, crossing and at the very beginning the Roman cavalry was simply demolished by the war elephants um, Hannibal simply let loose uh, a charge with the war elephants and the Roman the horses you know the horses are just gonna run uh, a man may stay to fight uh, a man may be stupid enough or fool enough to try to fight the elephant, but the horse is going to run. The horse is going to escape, uh, and the uh, Roman cavalry is simply just swept away by the war elephants. And then the Spanish, the famed uh, Numidian cavalry, along with the uh, Spanish cavalry that Hannibal brought over, simply rides in and decimates the Romans. Uh, about thirty thousand Romans and their allies are killed in this battle. It was a jarring shock for the Romans. These are now quickly two. These are quickly two uh, battles in which they, in which they've just been just beaten, beaten uh, and beaten badly. Uh, but the Romans, they do not despair. Uh, they still have they their allies, their Italian allies are still standing by them, and they still have a very strong resolve to simply put an end to this matter. Um, they really didn't see Hannibal as being that great of a danger, that great of a threat at this point. So the Romans, they raise a new force. Uh, to block Hannibal's um, further uh, to, blo to block it past south but the forces uh, split uh, but the commander split the force um, on both sides of uh, a peninsula and he flips through them okay he flips through them by going through marshland and he burns the plains of Tuscany by this point you know he's uh, if you if you have seen a map of Italy uh, he's left North Italy Italy north of the uh, Po River uh, and he's now moved south into uh, Tuscany and he's burning the plains of Tuscany uh, illustrating Roman weakness to her to uh, her allies because one of his overall battle uh, strategies was to simply turn the Roman Italian allies against Rome and by defeating the Romans on Italian soil and by uh, and by attacking and simply looting and burning the allies of the Romans he would illustrate that the Romans were no way capable of protecting them and that if they wanted to be protected if they wanted to uh, enjoy peace and security they would have to leave the Roman alliance structure and maybe join something that Carthage put into place so he's uh, so he's going off there illustrating Roman weakness and the uh, the overall commander a man named Flaminius uh, he um, he comes out to stop Hannibal he he gives Hannibal chase uh, he follows him all over Italy and he, pursue, he uh, pursues him across Tuscany to a little village by Lake Trasimene and Hannibal lures him into this narrow val uh, narrow pathway while being screened by morning fog 
and then he launches a devastating attack, slaughtering the Romans by the shore. About 15,000 men die in little over three hours of fighting. And now Rome, they have suffered three severe, severe defeats in two years, and now they're taking drastic measures. They appoint a man named Quintus Fabius Maximus to be dictator. And now don't think of dictator as... Don't think of a dictator as being uh, synonymous with the way we view Saddam Hussein uh, or Kim Jong-il. Uh, this was a uh, man who was legally entitled, legally uh, given the right and the responsibilities from the Roman Republic to defend the Roman state. And his job was to be an overall military commander to put down the threat that, that, that the Romans now see Hannibal as being. So Maximus... He raises a force of 90,000 men from Rome, from uh, the, the average citizens of Rome and her allies, 90,000 men. But he does not engage Hannibal. He realizes that uh, Hannibal is just too smart, too wily. You know, he, he may think that he has Hannibal where he wants him, but he's where Hannibal wants him. And he realizes that if he's defeated, that if this 90,000 man army is destroyed, then that would just, you know... Uh, that would simply cause Rome's prestige to fall even lower while skyrocketing Hannibal's prestige. And so he does not engage Hannibal. He harasses Hannibal's movements. Uh, Hannibal sends out scouts. He attacks Hannibal's scouts. Uh, towns and villages decide to assist Hannibal. He destroys the towns and the, village, and the villages. Uh, and his, his overall hope was to simply exhaust Hannibal's army. Uh, this, of course does not go over well with the uh, the politicians in Rome. They want Fabius to use that 90,000 men to smash Hannibal's army. They're saying you have all these men under your command, you can go out there and you can beat him down, you can destroy him and end him. Uh, Fabius isn't doing that, so when his term is up, and the, and the dictatorship is only for one year, so when Hannibal's, uh, when Hannibal's time is up, when his term is up, he's forced from office and he is not reinstated as dictator. And this leads us to uh, the Battle of Cannae, which was probably Hannibal's finest moment. His, uh, his star was never brighter than at this moment. The Romans, always, uh, always weary of giving one man too much power, they send out uh, two commanders to have joint command of that 90,000 men that were under the command of, of uh, Maximus. Then the two commanders uh, chosen uh, are Varro and Paulus, and they have differing strategies on how to uh, on how to uh, approach Hannibal, so they alternate commands uh, with Varro on one day and Paulus on the other. And Varro, Varro is a hothead. He really wants to engage Hannibal. He really wants to beat uh, beat Hannibal, defeat him, and earn a uh, earn a triumph. So Varro leaps at his chance to confront Hannibal at Cannae. Now the Romans deploy in their traditional formation. You know they're lining everything up. They're getting ready for their for their uh, usual orderly battle, uh, progressions of battle, but the Carthaginians, the Carthaginians decide uh, to uh, deploy in a semicircle, an arc uh, facing out, uh, almost like a bubble. And now the uh, Carthaginian begins the battle with a tremendous charge, and it carries away the Roman cavalry. So the both cavalry forces are uh, have been uh, have been in, have uh, engaged before the. The ground troops before the infantry forces have been engaged. Both cavalry forces have engaged and the Romans are swept away. So the Romans can't expect any support from their cavalry. And now the Roman infantry advances. And now the Roman infantry, uh, they're advancing and they're facing Hannibal's center. So Hannibal sends more men, uh, and, they, and they send more men to break Hannibal's center. They figure that if they break him in the center, they can simply destroy his flanks. Now Hannibal's infantry holds, and it flanks advancing on the Romans, and uh, and then the cavalry comes in to smack the Romans from the rear. So what you have going on is uh, uh the ultimate kill box. You have uh you have Hannibal forces arranged like this to begin with in this uh, outward facing semicircle arc, and as the Romans are coming in, they're simply uh, reversing it, so that now uh, instead of uh, an arc. You have this sort of U shape that Hannibal forces uh, now have the Romans um, trapped in. Has more and more Roman infantry are coming in. Their center is giving way, giving way, giving way, giving way, drawing them in, and his flanks are turning inwards. 
And what was interesting with that, in his uh, in his center, he had a, he had all his swordsmen placed, but on his flanks he had spearmen. So you have the spearmen fighting at a distance with their spears out, closing in almost like uh, teeth, closing in uh, on the Romans on their flanks. And then the cavalry just simply comes in and smashes him from behind, and they continue to smash in uh, from behind, you know, just decimating the Romans. And now the Romans are trapped in uh, what's known as a double envelopment or a kill box. You know, just think of it as a kill box. They're just they're boxed in and they're just being slaughtered. There's nowhere to run, nowhere to go. Um, half the sides are closing in. Half the the center is holding. Um, the men can't even reach grab for their swords or raise the arms to swing their sword. They're simply just packed in like sardines waiting to be killed. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's one of the bloodiest battles in history. It is a complete example of total war. And it took six hours for the battle to be done with. And when it's all said and done, 70,000 Romans and their allies are killed. Um, he, but after this, Hannibal does not march on Rome. Uh, he uh, his his overall his plan his plan his strategy remember was to illustrate to Rome's allies that Rome cannot defend them that Rome is incapable of defending Italy he wants the uh, the effect the psych the psychological effect of the battle to sink into Rome's allies so now the Romans uh, the Romans they they finally get wind of this Varro comes back um, Paulus. Paulus doesn't return from the battle. He's wounded. The last thing heard about him is that he he had a head wound and he was that sort of just sitting on a rock with his hands in his head, bleeding profusely. He's never heard from again. It's assumed that he died of his wounds or he was just killed by uh, some nameless uh, mercenary, Carthaginian mercenary. But he's never heard from again. But Varro, Varro makes it back to Rome and he tells everybody. Uh, he tells everybody, and after this, you know, Hannibal, he thought that the Romans would come to terms, that they would end the war, and that Carthage would have a, a better peace treaty, that they, the Carthaginians might be able to impose the type of treaty that the Romans imposed on them. Well, he was wrong. Uh, the Romans doubled down. They hardened their resolve against both Hannibal and the Carthaginians. There is no going back. They're at the point of no return. They go back. And they decide to adopt Fabius' plan, the plan of simply waiting Hannibal out. They adopt that plan, and they hold out, and their allies stick, uh, stand by them. You know, you think about this in the past uh, three in the past three years. There have been no good news about the battlefield, the, the war being fought in your backyard, and there's no good news. Uh, every time you send out an army, your army is defeated. Uh, there's no hope. Uh, at least there's no visible hope of the war uh, being resolved in the manner that you want. But Rome is saying that we don't really care. We're not giving up. And her allies stand by her. The most remarkable thing about the entire uh, Second Hannibalic War and Hannibal's career in Italy is that he was never able to shake Rome's allies from her. They would, The allies would not abandon Rome. They would stand with her to through thin. This is all thin right now and they're standing by her. Whew. Huh. A lot to say right there. Um, and Varro. Uh, another remarkable thing about this is that Varro. Varro, the commander at uh, Cannae, the man who sort of jumped at the opportunity to fight Hannibal, he's giving a commendation. He's giving a standing ovation and, a, and he's voted a thanks by the Roman Senate for not despairing of the Republic in her hour of need. That is also one of the most, uh, just, just surely, just um, purely one of the most amazing things about this entire uh, war is that Varro is give Varro a thanks basically for destroying the army under his command by the Senate. Now Hannibal, Hannibal's response was just he was just bewildered by the entire thing. He uh, he can't he can't really siege lay siege to Rome if the Roman allies can you know just raise an army and attack him from the rear. He also doesn't have the siege equipment to to uh, just lay siege to Rome. He had a field army under his command, not uh, an army capable of just starving out a city like Rome. Um, 
So he becomes little more than a terror because the Romans and their allies, they're not about to pit, uh, fight him in a pitched battle. He becomes little more than a terror, a brigand terrorizing Italy for the next 12 years. Yes, for 12 years he's trapped in Italy, nowhere to go, no way to uh, break the Roman power. All the wall cities are doing just fine. The, the Carthaginians Unions can't get to them. Um... Uh, the wall cities are fine. He can't he can't lay siege to them. The Romans aren't gonna fight him. He really has nothing to do. So while he was victorious uh, in battle in this Italian campaign, the uh, the campaign overall was a failure because he was unable. He didn't really have the resources to uh, bring Italy to heel to really uh, put his battles to put the uh, to put those battles that he won to good use. And now uh, we're going to pause here. The video is already at about 26 minutes. So I'm going to pause here and come back with part two. And we'll finish up with uh, Hannibal Barker's career.